This is Alan Farley from FX Empire. Please subscribe to the FX Empire YouTube channel. Today we're going to be talking about range indicators. Now range indicators are a technical tools that are hybrid indicators. In other words, they'll go and examine a trading range, giving you information about where the edges of those trading ranges are. And in those interfaces between ranges and trends, that's where there's some very good entries and exits. Now, again, it's a hybrid indicator and also produces volatility information. Some of them produce uh, trend following information. Some of them produce uh, relative strength information. What we'll try to focus on are, are um, five indicators that uh, really uh, produce some very interesting range bound information, which is very important information in creating trending strategies. Now, we'll start with average true range using the FX Emperor Advanced Charting System. We'll go ahead and pull up the study for average true range by typing in the search box, just average, it should pick it up. And there it is, average true range. Now, average true range uh, tries to define uh, price range from uh, bar to bar over a certain look back period. I believe in this case, it's probably a 14 period. You see that's an ATR 14. So it's looking back over, uh, over 14 days or 14 bars, trying to determine whether the range is expanding or the range is contracting. Now, so this is what uh, average true range does with the Apple chart. And we use the Apple chart because almost everybody in the world knows what Apple is and what its chart looks like at this point. So according to ATR here, uh, the uh, range is actually contracting during this period of time uh, when it's, uh, it looks like it's trending higher. And notice how it becomes non-directional at certain times. Here it's following, uh, it's, following uh, it's, it's declining into a contracted state. Uh, while price is dropping. And here it's, uh, it's falling into contracted state while price is rising. A lot of this has to do with how much resistance there is to higher or lower prices. And uh, the less resistance and the easier the, uh, the uh, swing is, it should drop ATR down to a lower and lower levels. Now, as you can see, ATR right here has just dropped to a multi-month low right here. This is a 2.7 reading or so. Uh, we are, have been range bound. If you take a look, uh, go back to uh, what six months, we're trading almost the same level as we were six months from now. Uh, ATR is picking that up over time and drawing this a plot, which has now dropped down, telling us that, uh, you know, the stock hasn't moved much in the past six to nine months, which is really the truth of things right at this point in the market cycle. Okay, let's uh, move on to Darvis Box. Now, this is kind of a complicated indicator. Uh, it's even, even a little bit complicated for me because uh, it's, uh, it's a really complicated calculation but all that Darvis box is trying to do I'm sorry I have to put in the S for the for the Darvas they never guess who was this was named after yes it was somebody by the name of Darvis now uh, this indicator uh, is only going to draw boxes sometimes you'll see it where you'll have this continuous box after box after box but the original indicator is only going to produce boxes that when certain criteria are met and that criteria is that price is trying to extend to a, a area it hasn't been like a new high extends to that new high and then pulls back but doesn't fall back into the prior range. Now, as you can see, this is what set off the Darvis box right here. Here we have a little cup and handle from there to there, and then we have a breakout. Here's the extension, the breakout, there's the pullback, and here's our Darvis box. Now, this is a, a, ra a new range-bound period once this Darvis box is drawn, but in addition, the direction of the Darvis box is also indicates uh, a trending. So uh, here we have a lot of good range band information basically saying that this stock is stuck between 126 and 138. And when it clears that, it's going to actually produce another Darvis box, which is going to be pointed right on top of it. As you can see, there's a little bit of conflict because there's two different Darvis boxes going on. There's one right here, and then there's another one right here. And that's just the way um, uh, some charting programs will calculate it. There's no reason you can't have overlapping boxes. Now, this tells us that the points of opportunity are right where these boxes cross each other. Those are very uh, important points, uh, very important parts, uh, uh, points in time uh, when we can make trading decisions to buy or sell or to uh, tighten up our stops. Uh, but Darvis Box does take a lot of getting used to. If you take a look at the formula, let me pull that up. That's right, uh, Darvis Box, where are you? Right here. You'll see that there's a lot of inputs. First, we have an all-time high look-back period. In other words, the highest high over that period. Then we have to tell it what kind of data to use, whether the high, low, or close of the day. Then we have a little level offset. Now, this level offset... Uh, uh, it sort of determines when that uh, when that Darvis box is going to appear and how much above a, a prior high or below a prior low 
it has to bend in order to produce a box. And also, we need a minimum move. In this case, it's set at uh, four. It's set at five uh, five points. Finally, it's also also has a, a, a volume element. Your volume percentage of average four hundred percent. So. Uh, uh, in order for a Jarvis box to be produced, it has to reach a volume threshold as well, which makes sense because if you're moving it past a prior high or below a prior low, then uh, the volume should reflect that in terms of increased volume. That's a Jarvis box, and it takes a very long time to, to get to know how to use this uh, this uh, indicator successfully just because you'll go and you'll, and you'll look it up and there might only be one or two boxes on the entire screen. So you sort of have to wait for certain training conditions to make the Darvis box worth, worthwhile. Okay, let's move on from there to high-low bands, which is about as simple as the Darvis box is complex. Now, high-low bands are very much like Bollinger bands, except they are double or triple smoothed. In other words, we have a, we have a, a smooth moving average that's then smooth so that we don't get nearly as many fluctuations as you would get with a Bollinger band or a Keltner channel or, or a or one of those uh, channel type of indicators that's responding very quickly to price changes. So it still has the same sort of the same methodology where uh, when price extends out, out of the bottom or top of a band, uh, that should be a range extreme. Uh, and you'll, as you notice, it worked very well here. That first that first pull outside that top band, the first pull out, uh, downside the bottom, and even up here where we're across the top band. These are these are range extremes. So we're talking about price ranges again. As, as you can see, it's produced some very, very uh, sophisticated uh, predictions that have been very, very accurate. If you take a look here, well, here's a little bit of a false reading. We have, a, we have the band sort of poking its nose out of the top, and we have this little bit of action, but uh, it really took this reversal back here to, to, um, to get uh, the market moving in the other direction and to compress the range again. So uh, this uh, indicator, again, you use it the same way you use a Bollinger Band. When we get to extremes, we're expecting standard deviation to kick in. And also it tells us where there's going to be a lot of congestion. When these bands are pointed sideways, we're moving into very persistent trading ranges. And so that's something to keep in mind. Again, we have down, we have up and up, but then these sideways ones, especially if you're trying to analyze range information, this is very valuable when the high-low bands turn sideways. Okay, now we'll move on to the mass index which is another uh, interesting indicator. Um, it's over in studies, so we'll get rid of our high-low bands and we'll go to mass index. Now, let me get my definition of mass index correct. Uh, mass index, uh, again, it's plotted on the bottom of the chart. Uh, mass index uh, evaluates the range, the quality of the range between the high and the low of the security uh, over a specified period of time. Now, this one works kind of funky because uh, when, when this thing gets up to traditionally when uh, mass index gets above 27, that's why there's this line right here, it gets above 27 and then drops back to 2650. That's a reversal signal. It's not a directional signal because you get up to 27 to 20 to 28 going in either direction. Uh, but uh, as you can see, it got here just about to 2650, never made it. But here's where the reversal was. Now, uh, uh, mass index is sort of looking for that final pop, which we don't really have a good buy or sell or reversal signal here. But if we go back and look over time, here's a, here's a good one. Okay, let's see how this one works. You see how it went above that 27, all the way up to about 27.8. And then when it comes back down, here's the reversal signal right there. Now, do we get a reversal? Well, I, I don't see it. You know, maybe you see it. I don't see it. But because uh, it's, already, it's already responding to this downtrend. So it was kind of a, kind of a crappy signal. But as you can see, what the, what's supposed to happen if the signal is being reliable is you will get a pop maybe at the same time here where then it drops back to 2650. And sure enough, that was a uh, that was an interim high. And that was the start of a trading range, which, again, was very important and valuable information. But the thing about about uh, range bound indicators is they're best used in conjunction with other indicators. It's all well and good that you're going and uh, trying to interpret uh, uh, a trading range, uh, find out where the highs and lows are going to be very substantial barriers uh, to movement. But at the same time, you want to know, uh, you've got to pick a direction most of the time in order to make money in the market. So you're also looking for trending information. You're also looking for volatility information. And uh, a lot of times these uh, range bound indicators will also produce volatility information, which you expect to, you expect volatility to drop down to a very low level at the end of a range and start of a trend. And you expect volatility to go from a very high level and start to turn around at the end of a trend and the start of a range. 
and that's uh, one of the ways that swing trading works and uh, the way that a lot of swing trading strategies are based. Now, finally, let's look at an extremely popular uh, range bound indicator, and that is pivot points. Now, pivot points are widely used. I'm pretty sure that uh, many of the people using them don't really know exactly what they're using. In this case, these pivot points are just following the months. Uh, so, because we have a January one, and we have, excuse me, a January one, a February one, a March one, an April one, uh, but that could all be set through the uh, through the uh, by looking at the um, uh, pivot point, finding your pivot point resistance, and finding your support and resistance zones. But this one is done over a uh, over a 30 day period, uh, which follows sort of the standard pivot point setting. Now, here's the pivot point. the The black line is the pivot point. That's the calculated line. And then we have sort of we have standard deviation lines drawn above and below that line, which are calculated uh, uh, automatically by the indicator. And uh, the first one up here is called uh, R1. Well, that's the first resistance level. And then up here we have certain extension of R1, which is R2, which is another amplitude higher. Now down here we have support one or S1. We have a support two or S3. And we even have an S3 in this case. Oh, here we are. We have an R, uh, we have an R3 up here uh, on top. And we could set colors for this down here. And these are common areas where we'd expect reversals to take place. Now, the, uh, the theory behind uh, pivot points is that uh, if price is trading above a pivot point, that well, that's bullish. If price trades above a resistance level, well, that's, that's a, an acceleration of the trend. In this case, it was also a top. And here we have an acceleration of the trend, which was also a top. And uh, the same being, uh, if price is trading below the pivot point, uh, that means that's bearish. That's a quote unquote a downtrend. I mean, without looking at other ways to qualify what a downtrend is, looking at the price bars. And here we have an acceleration below uh, S1. And that was, it got really volatile, almost got down to S2, uh, but uh, it didn't hold very long. Notice how the pivot point uh, uh, starting in March uh, became resistance. We got back down to, uh, uh, this is S1 again. Then that resistance point was tested, that S1 was tested, and it held within the box for the entire month. Now, this is really interesting. It did happen also here where we got above the pivot line, we got right up to R1, and then uh, R1 just marked resistance through the entire month until we got a little breakout. And so you're actually using the same way you do with a price breakout, where you have a consolidation and it's pushing against it one, two, three times. And when it pushes higher, it actually gives us a buy signal heading into December. So a pivot point, again, uh, to me, it's always been sort of a lazy man's or lazy, lazy uh, woman's indicator uh, because uh, most, uh, most times we don't know exactly how the support and resistance lines are, are created in this sort of a very arbitrary process. And uh, in my way of thinking, I'd much rather have Bollinger Bands around these bars in order to get an idea when the standard deviation stretches too much that we're going to get a reversal. But some people swear by it, especially in the commodity markets. And pivot points can be used again in any time view. If we want to go down to say a, a one hour chart, then you're going to get a whole different set of pivot points. Here we have uh, here we have one, two, three, four, five. So this is set up for five trading sessions. Each pivot point is set for five trading sessions or just uh, for a week of trading, which makes perfect sense. And you see, as we go in from one week to the next, it's automatically bullish because it's above, it's above that black pivot line. And the trading just within those boundaries for the entire uh, week. Same here, where we go and you break, you break the uh, pivot going into the following week, and it stays below it for the entire week. So there's a lot of good predictive information. And these are just um, what are these one-hour bars? Excuse me. So we're talking about one, two, three. These are five hours of, of, of trading information. But no, one, two, three, four, five. No, okay. So five days, five days with one-hour bars. Okay, and so uh, as it shifts from one week to another, according to this, and you can see some of these are not 4, 9, 4, 16, 4, uh, 19. Yeah, so this is, goes from Monday to Friday, and it's going and, and it's, it's carrying the information from one week into the next one. It's recalculating the point. And as you can see in an uptrend, the pivot point is the pivot line is moving up along with the trend, and it's also compressing the support and resistance levels because of the sideways action going into there. This requires a lot of interpretation. It's not everybody's cup of tea, but pivot points, if you know how to handle them, uh, are a very, very potent form of uh, technical analysis and prediction.